Cardinal Louis Antonio Tagle, it's a pleasure to meet you and thank you very much for doing this interview. Oh, thank you for having me. Your Eminence, let me begin by asking you about growing up in the Philippines. What was it like, your childhood, your family life? Well, my, my family is a normal, ordinary Filipino family. My parents uh, were hardworking uh, Filipinos, you know, and the focus, I remember, was very simple. Life was very simple. And when life is simple, the focus is also clear. Our lives re revolved around family, the parish church, school, and the plaza, where people congregate, where people meet each other, people get to know each other. So in a way, I can say that uh, growing up with the family that I had, growing up in the town that we had, in the parish that we had, simplified many things for me, you know, and we knew how to prioritize. But hard work, hard work, really. No substitute for hard work. No, 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 no. And simple living, you, 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 you earn, but if you splurge on things which are not important, then it amounts to nothing. And so we <laughs> also combined, you know, hard work with priorities and where you could be uh, simple and not aspire for, uh, for, for a lifestyle that is beyond your means, then that's good. Mm -hmm. And as a child growing up, what kind of things were you into? What sparked your interest? I was fascinated with the sciences and uh, I think I was brainwashed by my, <laughs> by my parents and teachers into uh, preparing myself for medical school. So I was bent on really going to, uh, to, uh, to become a doctor. Your parents wanted you to be a doctor. Uh, yes, uh, and I also wanted it. Mm -hmm. I, and I did well in, in the sciences, uh, math courses. Yeah. Uh, I think I was 13 years old when I started reading uh, medical books in preparation for uh, uh, medical school, you know. But uh, that got interrupted, you know, when I was uh, invited to join a youth group in, in the parish. Yeah. Joining that youth group, being surrounded by more people of their faith, yeah. how did that affect you? I was bef befriended by a young priest who was the assistant pastor of the parish and who served also as a spiritual director of our group. And I did not realize that I was already getting inspired. But then he left, he was transferred to another parish. The priest who took his place yeah, was good to us, but I did not have that emotional, affective uh, link with him. And uh, he invited me to uh, an entrance examination, you know, uh, in the Jesuit University, which was one of the top universities in the Philippines. And he said, he told me, oh, I heard that you want to go into medical school, so why not try out, you know, this uh, Jesuit University? And they have scholarships, you know, if you want. So, so yeah, I'm willing. So he said, we can. Uh, uh, you can take the entrance exam, but it's a, it's a, it's a ba battery of exams. I did not know the place. I was brought there. The first exam, no, yeah, no. name, age, etc. And then there was one question, type of vo vocation. So I went to the proctor. I said, what do I put here? He said, priesthood. I said, why priesthood? They said, uh, this is an entrance exam to the seminary. So I was you were tricked. <laughs> yes, I was tricked. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I was so angry. Uh, uh, but but the, the priest uh, uh, told me, I said, well, I just wanted to, to break your, your mindset. Uh, try to consider other options. You know, you're young, but you have narrowed down your choices to only one. And when did it become a serious proposition, the life of a priest? Uh, you know, uh, the, the, this priest who tricked me succeeded in confusing me. Yeah. And so uh, 
I, 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 I really asked myself, do I, do I really want to become a doctor? And I was convincing myself, yes. Then the results of the exams came out. I flunked the exam, you know. I was accepted to the university, but not to the seminary, you know. And then I felt sad. And then again, I told myself, if you don't want to enter the seminary, why are you sad? You know? So that started the soul searching. And then all the experiences in the parish, the apostolate and the, uh, and the witness of, of these good priests. You make it sound like it was just a series of coincidences and luck, but I mean, there must have been something within you that was roping yes, you in. Yes, yes. And, uh, and it, it seems that I needed people who saw or who see something in me that I failed to see. You know, to to shake me and to uh, to wake me up. <laughs> because you were young, you were 24 when you became a priest? Yes. Was yes. that a difficult decision to make as a 24-year-old? You know, I, I have a, a, a deep sense of, of, of not really making it my project. My project is to respond and let him call, you know. So even now, when I try to uh, uh, plan pastoral approaches or what, no, I make sure that I'm not the one calling the shots. Was there any struggle within you when you thought about the things that you would be giving up, let's say, now as a, an ordained priest, mm. marriage, a family? Yeah. Your life was going to be completely different. I faced everything, I should say, with faith. I say, I, I know, uh, is in God's hands. So whenever there seems to be some form of regret, you know, I just remember how God has been taking care of me and the regret is, uh, is secondary. <laughs> you were 55 when you became a cardinal? Yes. And I remember seeing that footage and you were in tears. You were crying. <laughs> why, why was that moment so emotional? I guess it was a mixture of, uh, I, I did not expect it. Uh, when I look back, I say, my being a priest was, started with a joke. And then when I was named the bishop, I cried and cried and I said, I am not prepared for that. I'm, I, did, I don't even see myself as a bishop. And I have to confess, even up to now, I, I struggle with that. With, I don't see myself as a bishop. And I, I sometimes doubt myself. And why is that? I, th I think that I, I was prepared to teach. I was prepared to be a, a, a theology researcher. And I, am st I was still struggling with that, you know, uh, how to become a bishop. And once in a while, as I f confront myself, are you behaving like a bishop? Do you really consider yourself, are you faithful to, be, uh, to being a bishop, etc.? And then suddenly you become a cardinal. But are you comfortable now with the, the role as cardinal? Uh, I'm trying my best to, uh, not to be comfortable in the sense that, uh, uh, that it becomes routine. No, I, 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 I don't want that to happen. Uh, when, when I say comfortable, for me, it is to accept in faith, you know, whatever the demands may be. And if, even if I don't see myself, I, I, let, let me put it this way, if I were God, I would not choose me <laughs> to, to be a, a bishop or a cardinal. But since I am not God, God sees something in me probably that I don't see in myself. And I just have to trust God's knowledge of me. And uh, even if I see my poverty, my, uh, my limitations, my weaknesses uh, that might prevent me from being convinced that I am a good, <laughs> a good candidate for this position, you are one of the youngest cardinals in the world and arguably one of the most popular as well. I know even on social media, on Facebook, you have half a million followers. Is that something that you consciously do, reach out to younger people in the church through social media 
you've your own television slot as well back in the Philippines. Yes. I got convinced that uh, this is the this is the area to go, you know. And if you want to bring the good news, especially to uh, the youth of today, then you mindful of of, of the uh, of the uh, ambivalence and also the some of the pitfalls in the, the contemporary social, uh, the means of social communication still, if, if put to good use, it could, it could be a vehicle for uh, evangelization and also for uh, bringing more people to the Lord. You know? So in that sense, I, uh, I, I, I deliberately do that, you know, being in touch with uh, through media. Mm -hmm. The Philippines is a fascinating country, a booming country, yeah. over 106 million people is the population. And uh, uh, yeah, 100, uh, 100, they say at least 100 million. 100 million people. At least, yeah. A lot of them, of course, living in poverty, around 25% yeah, sure. of them below the poverty line. What do you see as the biggest challenges today for the Filipino people? The, the scandal of, uh, of dehumanizing poverty. No. Uh, and it has become systemic. No. Uh, I was talking with one poor uh, man who, who was a driver of a public, you know, and it was, I remember it was close to election time at that time, and then, uh, so I asked him also, how, how do you choose, you know, the mayor <laughs> or among the candidates, etc. And he told me, I have lived through four presidents and I'm still a driver. Mm -hmm. You'd see that, uh, it says, many things are changing, but the, the, the living conditions of some people have remained stagnant or even worse. And, and I call this a scandal because uh, it reflects to us how justice is lived, how the common good is pursued or not pursued. So these are the, the, the principles of uh, the social gospel of, of the church, you know, the gospel taking a social form. And in a country that is predominantly Christian, even Catholic, we, we are really stabbed in the heart, you know? It's like a dagger pointed at our consciences. That what, what's happening? We, we realize too that now uh, one country is always connected to, to others. We are not, you are not in full control, but still you have something to, uh, to look into. Now, what do you think really needs to be tackled? Is it the corruption? Is it the poverty? Is it the crime? You know, those are, th those are interconnected. Mm. You know, because of poverty, you know, criminality becomes an option for some. Not because they, they want to be criminals, necessity. but uh, necessity. And then uh, it becomes a lifestyle, it becomes that, you know. And then when corruption uh, becomes systemic, you know, and then you see that the corrupt are leading comfortable lives. And do you see it as something that's getting better? Is it getting worse? Is it staying stagnant? When you look at the statistics, you know, they say that uh, the economy of the Philippines is improving. But you don't see that among the ordinary people? Uh, yes, and also the, uh, the, the past uh, seven years, there's been a steady growth in, uh, in the economy, mm -hmm. but also a growth in the number of poor people. Now, these past three years, there seems to be a decrease, you know, according to uh, statistics and to surveys, of people who, who claim that they are experiencing extreme poverty. And, and we hope that the surveys are accurate. Something that we take for granted here in the Western world, access to the internet. There are still huge areas of the Philippines and pockets of society where they are just gaining access to the internet yeah. now. And overall, we hope in the majority of cases that will lead to them broadening their horizons, being able to educate themselves, yeah. become involved in e-commerce. But you've seen um, the negative effects of that, where yeah. exploitation and abuse yes, is yes. creeping in. Yeah. You know, again, no, this is one area, one example of human progress 
becoming also ambivalent. You know? and, and it is not just in uh, the internet and everything. You know? In the history of humanity, wherever there is uh, a sign of progress, we know also that it could be used and abused, for some yeah. and abused. Mm -hmm. and, and here, you know, as you said, you know, uh, the, the internet has a way of connecting with people, broadening the horizon, education, you know, uh, even our capacity to, to empathize and to build solidarity, ties of solidarity, these are all possible with the internet. Unfortunately, it could be used also. You know? like one horrible case is the use of the internet for online exploitation of children and of vulnerable peoples. Due to poverty, some families, it's, it's just the pa parents. The parents the who are parents the perpetrators who of this. Yeah, per shame. These things, online exploitation, is happening in the homes, mm -hmm. in the secrecy of the homes. And I've s okay. heard you talk before, Cardinal, where you've said that when you confront these families and the parents, they don't see it as real abuse yeah. because it's not a physical thing, it's through a webcam it is, or online. Yes. That, 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 uh, that um, remark coming from a parent was reported to me by some religious women who uh, have rescued some children. And uh, when uh, they interviewed uh, some of the parents, they said, well, this is not real abuse because the client is in another continent. You know, so the client is not touching my child. I am the one touching my child. And it, it can be used as an excuse. Huh? Since it is virtual, then it is not, not real. Yes. And, and what makes me sad is I know the Filipino family. I know the Filipino culture. This is almost unthinkable you know, for, for uh, the regular Filipino family mm -hmm. to enter into. And so you wonder what? made them do it. Is it just necessity or has there been um, a change of values, etc.? And so you, we, we have also been advocating some sort of a philosophical or theological reflection on the humanity of, 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 of children and, and of all stages of life because it is easy to, in our world right now when commodification is a, uh, is a mindset. Human beings are seen as commodities, but the most, um, uh, I mean, the, the most vulnerable in that type of mentality is children. Mm. Let's talk for a moment about the scandal within the church and mm. within the Catholic Church in the Philippines. Do you think the Filipino people are satisfied with how you and the church have dealt with the clergy who perpetrated some of these awful crimes on children? Oh no! You know the the whenever there are uh, cases of uh, maltreatment of, of 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 children, you know that uh, nobody nobody will take that lightly. You know? especially when those that are accused of doing it are supposed to be the moral leaders. So included there are the priests, uh, the religious, etc. You know? so in the Philippines there is a great sensitivity to that. No, especially this this uh, past years, where uh, I was not yet a bishop when the bishops of the Philippines uh, formulated some sort of guidelines on how to uh, to uh, respond to that. No, and we we have seen you know, uh, an increase also in uh, uh, people's uh, awareness and also reporting mm. of cases. You know, and. Uh, the, 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 the dioceses are more alert now and more responsive, especially in relationship with the Vatican, you know, because of the, of the protocols. You know. But even with all the reporting and the cases that have come to light yeah. within the Philippines, not one arrest, not one person prosecuted? Well, you know, it is a yes, but at the same time, they don't uh, always find fault in the church because the laws, and why haven't the, the law come after those people, those clergy? They handle it within the canonical process, you know. But the civil, civil uh, legislation is different from what you find in Europe or in uh, other parts of the world. And do you find that most people in the Philippines uh, are satisfied with that, with it being dealt internally within the church? 
some, some are, are generally, yeah. in fact, some would trust the canonical process better than the, uh, the, uh, the civil cases. How is the Catholic Church in the Philippines today? The, it's a very young country. I remember reading that the medium age is 24 years of age yes. in the Philippines. Uh, Are the youth as into their faith as, let's say, their parents' generation? I, I should say yes, but the expressions are different. The, 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 the older generation has transmitted to the young, especially the expressions related to popular religiosity. So when we have processions, pilgrimages, the young people come in the millions. So there, it, the, you could see that there is an element of the faith that has entered the culture and has become cultural and religious at the same time. And also, they ask questions because uh, the, the Philippine society has also changed. You know, there are intermarriages, so you have, uh, uh, you have uh, the ecumenical issues, inter-religious issues, uh, and they start question, uh, asking uh, questions. Uh, I, I visit the state universities uh, to engage the young people in dialogue. In one university, the first question that I got was, is my prayer valid? if I don't make the sign of the cross. So you could see that these children probably have friends who are not Catholic and who ask them, why do you make the sign of the cross? And then that generates a question in them. But when they ask their parents that, the parents panic, said, why are you doubting your faith? Oh, so we say, no, no, to ask questions is not a sign that someone is losing faith. Maybe is searching for you know, faith looking for intelligence <laughs> where intelligent intelligibility faith rather than uh, blind faith. Yes, yeah. yes, and it is good. Finally, Your Eminence, what gives you still today uh, your energy for the job that you're doing, your passion? Where does it come from? I I hesitate to say this, but uh, I won't be honest. Also, if I don't say it, I think it's 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 love. You know. You love Jesus and uh, you love the church because uh, I have been loved. <laughs> I have been loved, you know, uh, even, even if I know I do not deserve that love, that trust from God and, and from the church. And uh, how could you be, how could you be uh, tepid and, <laughs> and uh, 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 you know, lifeless when, uh, you're surrounded by love. And I know you're very happy working in the Philippines, in your home city, but would you like to work in Vatican City someday? I'm, I, I, I am a member of, of so many offices there, so, the, so I, uh, I uh, frequent uh, Rome and the Vatican, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I, I, could, I could say that I'm already working there, so... Uh, <laughs> but many people say that you could be a man that could be there maybe with a full-time role. Uh, I, I don't think so. I don't think they want me there. <laughs> <laughs> You've said that all your life and it's never gone to plan. Occasional visits probably, they would, they, they would appreciate my coming for occasional visits, but for me to stay there probably they would not want <laughs> Well, Cardinal Luis Antonio Tagal, it's been a pleasure talking to you and thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you too. Thank you. I enjoyed it.